All right, welcome back to Operating Systems. Another fun, fun lecture we have. So today we might have heard the word kernels before, or may have not, but today we'll be talking about kernels. So a lot of this stuff will be like a lot of low-level details you don't actually need to know. There's not that much you need to know from this lecture, so I'll point it out. Uh, this is more kind of understanding how things actually work. So I left you off with this example at the end of lecture one. I told you this is a full hello world example in only 168 bytes. So I will again prove that it actually works. So if I switch over and I try to execute it, prints hello world, exactly like you would expect if you wrote it in C or whatever language you want. So with that, Let's try and explain what in the heck this mess is. So first aside is the term ISA or instruction set architecture. So there's three major ones in use today. You should probably know what they are. Again, you won't be tested on this, but we'll touch on them in various aspects of this course and it's probably good to know what you're actually running on. So it's the actual machine code or what numbers your CPU actually understands and can execute. So x86-64 is the dominant CPU architecture for like servers, desktops, any non-Apple laptops will be this architecture. Most of the, yeah, most of the desktops on the planet are that. Uh, game consoles, all that stuff. Then there's ARCH-64 or ARM-64. So that's ARM, you've done that in your computer organization class, at least some variety of ARM. ARM64 is just kind of the latest one. And that's used in all your phones, your tablets, and if you're lucky enough to have an Apple laptop, that's new, it's in that too. And then RISC-V is an open source implementation or an open source architecture that's kind of similar to ARM, but you're actually allowed to use it without paying millions of dollars. So you could make your own CPU in that. Uh, so some of the assembly we'll read in this course are, is RISC-V, but it's really readable, and if you have any questions, you can ask. Uh, this lecture, since I'm executing it on my laptop, it, it's going to be ARM64 assembly, but throughout the course, you never have to write assembly, so don't worry about it. All right, so abstractions, everyone likes a good abstraction, so we touched on it before, but I'll really explain it now. So our next abstraction is what's called a file descriptor. So because all our processes are completely independent, we argued that they have virtual registers and virtual memory that you should know. Well, if they're completely independent, they're actually kind of useless if they can't talk to each other. So there is an explicit way for processes to communicate with each other and it's just called IPC or inter process communication. And that just means communicating between processes. And because uh, you otherwise want to be completely independent, you have to be really explicit about this. So what a file descriptor is, is just a resource. You don't know exactly what type of resource. We can argue what some resources it could be. But it's just a resource that is really generic that can either, you can either read bytes from or you can write bytes to it. And it's identified by an index that's stored in the process. So that index is unique to the process. So as that process goes on, it's the, the process itself is the only one that can manipulate that. But what the file descriptor points to or what bytes it gets sent to, it could change, it depends, uh, it could close, it could, whatever the thing it represents could disappear, you're not quite sure. So right now what a file descriptor could represent for us is it could represent an actual file because it's named a file descriptor, that would be a pretty good name, or actually it might represent your terminal. Your terminal works the same way, like if you say print anything to your terminal, you're really just writing bytes to your terminal and then your terminal is being nice and displaying it to you in something you can actually read. So, whenever you're trying to make calls directly to the core part of the operating system, you can represent them like regular old C functions. So, we'll explore two system calls we need for a basic Hello World program. And the first would be called write. 
And it takes three arguments, a file descriptor just called FD, a buffer, which is just a pointer to some array of bytes, and then a count, which is how many bytes you want to write to this file descriptor. So when the function returns, it will return the number of bytes actually written to that file descriptor. And again, we're not too sure what it could represent. It could represent anything. And then the next system call we need is something called exit group. And it takes one argument, a status, and it exits the current process and sets a status exit code, which can be any number between 0 and 255, which is just a byte, which is bigger than an int. So if you pass a large number on it, it will essentially just take the least significant byte of that and set that as your exit status. So that's the only two system calls we need to actually make a Hello World program in Unix, which is Mac OS or Linux. So to explain a little bit more, there's other conventions that just help make the magic of your computer work. So by convention, whenever a process starts, there are three magic file descriptors that are already open for your process. And they're just numbers, and you just follow the convention, everyone agrees on it, and the numbers actually have some type of meaning. So by convention, file descriptor zero is supposed to represent standard input, which is a file descriptor you can read from or get information from. So when you wrote your C application in 105 and you took input from the user, well, if it was running on Linux or Mac OS, it was using file descriptor zero to read that information from the user and your operating system handled with, whoops, getting all the information out of it. But at the end of the day, it was file descriptor zero. And then similarly, there is standard output, which is file descriptor one. And that's where things go by default if you do a printf. So if you do a printf under the hood, it will actually write to file descriptor one because that's the magical number that's supposed to represent standard output. Then there is also a magical file descriptor two that you can write things that are supposed to represent error messages and things like that. And we'll figure, we'll see in a little bit why that convention is useful. So the most basic hello world program, assuming I don't need, I don't even need main anymore. If I just created a magic function called start and I could tell my operating system to just start executing this function, this is all I would need for hello world. So I would need to write to file descriptor one, an array of characters called hello world that has all the data I need, and then 12 because that's the length of the string that I want to print to my terminal. And then after that's done, all I need to do is exit group because I'm just printing hello world. Hello world was already printed, so I can end this process. So any questions about this minimal hello world? So this is like the smallest we could possibly get hello world if we figured out how to start just executing this straight away. Yep. Does the name of the function being underscore start have anything to do with the label of the same name that we used in on in 243? Yeah, so there's a question. In 243, we used this underscore start is there anything special with it? So yeah, there's a special thing with it. So for most assemblers, if it's called underscore start, it will actually start executing at that. And that's just a convention by the assemblers. So I just kind of called it that because it kind of lines up. But if you could magically make it, make your thing start executing, you could call it whatever you want. You just have to tell your assembler. Okay, so this is as simple as hello world can get. So as another aside, so you've probably heard the term API before. Um, an API is like a very generic thing. In this course, we might actually care about something called the ABI. So an example of an API or application programming interface, all it does is give you very vague details about what the function does and what arguments it takes. So for example, if you said, hey, a function takes two integer arguments, and returns an integer that's supposed to represent the addition of them or the multiplication or whatever. That's your like ABI or API description. So an ABI is like the low level details specific to your architecture where 
every argument exactly is, how you know, the calling convention works between them, where arguments need to be. So again, in 243, two, the ABI would be like, you know, you're making a function call, you have to set up registers a certain way, and then you've in, whenever you're in the function, you know you have to use those same registers as you pass, they have to agree with each other. So an ABI would be like, hey, for this function, I need to pass argument X and register zero or something like that. Um, there's a C calling convention. The C calling convention just puts arguments on the stack. So that's an example of another one and I'll put it out, but uh, we don't need to know the details other than C uses the stack for its calling convention in general. So here's the ABI, the system call ABI for Linux on ARM64. Because the operating system, it doesn't really have functions because the functions require an address and you're not allowed to monkey with the operating system. Like you can't just call an address and just have it work. So instead of calling address, if you want to make a request to the operating system and do a system call, there's actually a special instruction that will generate an interrupt for the operating system to handle. And in 243, well, you dealt with interrupts, so you could imagine what the operating system has to do. So there's actually a special instruction here you can call if you really know what you're doing, and it's called SVC on ARM64, and that's the instruction that will trigger the interrupt, and then the OS or the, yeah, the OS would go ahead and service that interrupt, do whatever it needs to do, and then return back to wherever it was executing. So the actual ABI is like, there are certain registers that need to have certain arguments. So in the X8 register, that just has to have the system call number. So each system call is associated with a number. So it's like, if I want to do the right system call, I put a specific number in that register. If I want to do another system call, it's just another, it's just another number. And then system calls can take up to six arguments and registers. So can anyone think of any limitations to this ABI for making system calls? The numbers are limited? Yeah, the numbers are limited. I can only have six arguments. So in C, how many arguments are you allowed to have? Infinite? Pretty. <laughs> Pretty much infinite until you run out of stack space or you run out of memory. But this six total, anyone think of any other limitation of this? Yep. There's limited numbers you can pass as a system call number? Yeah, there is limited numbers you can pass as a system call, but specifically for like the other arguments. Like, what if I wanted to pass a double or something? Yeah, so that's the other limitation. The other limitation of this, six arguments and they're the size of a register. So if you want, if you want something bigger, it won't fit. If you want something smaller, it'll waste space. But because C is stack based, they can be of different sizes. It's okay, it doesn't matter. So you'll never need to know the actual register numbers. The only important thing you need to know is like system call ABI uses registers. That's the details are like, because I have to painstakingly uh, show you what the code actually does. So here's the aside of a C ABI. It's stack based. Arguments are pushed on the stack from right to left order. This is for x86 64 bit. Again, we don't have to know this. And the advantages that this gives us compared to the system call ABI and disadvantages is pretty much the complete opposite. So. In general, using registers is also faster than using a stack because that would use memory. And, but you get more flexibility with the C API because you can have any number of arguments, they can be different sizes, all that fun stuff. So, next thing. So, now we have to discuss the executable file format. So, programs on Linux and PlayStation, I guess, use the ELF file format. And I told you that it was just a coincidence. It kind of looked like my last name. So ELF stands for Executable and Linkable Format. It's a kind of boring, generic title. And that's the file format for both executables and libraries. So it always starts with the four bytes we saw before. 
if you encode in ASCII, the first character represents a delete character, and then it's ELF, all in capitals. And those four bytes are literally called magic. It lets you know what kind of file this is. Other file formats just have other special numbers, and if you read them, then you know what type of file that's supposed to be, and you can try reading it. Like, for example, if you do that uh, read four bytes on any PDF, it'll start with a percent sign, PDF, and then a dash. So every PDF file on the planet will start like that. And that's how you know what a PDF file is. Okay, so the bytes I showed you at the very beginning that printed hello world, those actually represent an ELF file because, well, we also looked at the first four bytes of them. All this F ELF file does is it tries to load the entire executable into memory at address 10,000 hex. And if you go into the specification of the ELF file format, you'll find out that the file header has to be 64 bytes. And the program header, which uh, basically just tells it where to load, is 56 bytes. So of that 168 bytes, 120 of them are dedicated to this ELF file format to just tell it some fairly basic information. And then the next 36 bytes are the actual instructions. And then after that are 12 bytes for the actual string hello world. So if we can do a bit of math, the instructions start after the header files in here. So they start at byte 120. So if we convert 120 to hex, it's 75 in hex. And because the entire executable got loaded at 10,000 hex, we can add 75 to 10,000 to know where in memory our instructions start. So our instructions should start at 10,078 in hex. Similarly, our string should start after the instructions. So it's 156 byte is where it starts at, which is 9C. So the string starts at address 10,009C. Again, hopefully you don't have to calculate this yourself. This is why we use compilers, so you don't have to calculate this stuff. Uh, if you really want, there's a read elf at, or executable that will give you all the information about it. Uh, I don't suggest it, but again, I can't tell you what to do. You're adults, except for on exams, I can tell you what to do. So here's visually what that ELF file looks like. Oh, yep. Oh, so the question is what tells it to actually start at this address? Yeah, so it will here, we'll be here. So in the file header itself, which is the first 64 bytes, I won't go into detail about what bytes represent what, but some of the things you get told from this are the endianess of what the instructions are, the ISA it runs off, the entry point. So the entry point is where you tell the operating system to begin executing. So that address 10,078 would be here. And it would be specified in the ELF file here. And you can actually see it. So it's right here where my cursor is. So that's where it is. And that's how you tell the operating system where to start executing from. So if you had an assembler like in the other class and you weren't a, a psychopath like me that just wrote this in, in bytes, then it would have calculated that address for you and it would have stuck it right there. But I didn't do that. <laughs> uh, so that's like the important thing that's in the file, or file header is where, just where to start executing. And then the program, program header, all it basically tells is what to load into memory, where, and what permissions it has, which we'll get into later in the course. But that's the part that just says, load this thing at address 10,000 hex. Why 10,000 hex? Well, because I have virtual memory, I could have picked any old address I wanted to. I just would have had to recalculate where the string starts and where the instructions start. But I could have picked whatever I wanted. I just, that day, I like 10,000. And then here are the instructions. So th those are the next uh, 37 uh, bytes. And then the data is the 12 bytes. So if you actually disassemble the instructions and put it into online disassembler, which you don't have to do for this course, thankfully, but if you get into uh, 
you know, reverse engineering or you want to do some malware stuff and all that fun stuff, you might use a disassembler at some point. So this would be an exercise in that. So if you disassemble it, this is what the instructions look like. And they kind of correspond because we're making direct system calls here. So X8, we're just moving values into registers here. The X8 register stored the system call number. So for hello world, we need to make a write system call. So we put in the number 64. 64 represents write. And you just look that up or it's defined in a header file or something. Next is the first argument, which is file descriptor. Since we're hello world, we want to essentially print to file descriptor one. So we put one in register x0, which is the first argument. And the second argument, because it's ARM, we have to load that register in two steps. So first we load the byte with 9C, and then we add 10,000 hex to it to get the address of the or yeah, to get the address of the string which was that 10,009C. And then the next argument is the length of the string, which is just 12, or C in hex. And then this SVC would trigger a interrupt to the operating system, and then it would do the system call, and whenever it returns back from you, we would see hello world. And then next, we would need to make that exit system call, so we load up the new system call number, which for exit is 94, and then it only takes one argument, we'll give it zero, and then we do a system call here, and then the operating system kills our process, and yes, that is a technical term. We'll get lots of, tech, we'll get lots of gruesome terms. Your, uh, your Google searches are gonna get very interesting because of this course, but by the end of next week. It's gonna get, trust me, it's gonna get real weird. All right, any questions about this? Arguments that this is kind of hello world? <laughs> well, it must be hello world because I executed it and it worked. So the next 12 bytes again are the data. They're ASCII encoded. Do you need to know ASCII encoding? No, not really. Should you know what it is? Eh, it probably won't be bad. Uh, there's like a low level tip if you ever get really into ASCII because of the way they designed it. So if you want to figure out whether a character is upper or lower case, they made it really easy that you only have to check a single bit. So bit five, if it is zero, it means it's an upper case. If it's one, it means it's a lower case, which just means the values differ by 32. They designed it that way because computers back in the day were really, 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 really slow. So checking a byte, or sorry, checking a bit is like the fastest thing you can do. So that's why they did that. So that's every single byte of our program. We didn't waste anything, aside from the header files, might, you might argue, that are kind of wasteful. But let's go ahead and see what C does. And before this, can we spot some difference between our string and a C string? Yep. Uh, it end in yeah, it doesn't end in an all character. So it would be. Yeah, so it just doesn't end in a null character. Null character terminating strings is purely a C thing. The operating system doesn't care about that because if the write system call had to end with a zero string or a zero to terminate a string, it would stop writing by the time it got to zero. And if you ever want to actually write zero to a file, you couldn't do that if you were having C strings. It would just wouldn't happen because they're defined like that. So. Strings ending in null terminate characters is just a thing in C, although we'll be in C for this whole course, aside from this crazy example. So we finally got to the point where we can say what a kernel is. So a kernel is a core part of your operating system. That interrupt and changing and making a request to the operating system, well, that actually corresponds to a different physical privilege level on your CPU. So on your CPU, there's something called kernel mode, which is just a generic term, that as long as you are in that, operating in that mode, you have access to more instructions than you can otherwise use. So those are where all the instructions are that I can actually interact directly with hardware. And that forms the security that makes the operating system or the kernel have ultimate control over the hardware. There's actually like 
a physical barrier in the way. Your, your program is not allowed to change any hardware, even if you knew the instructions that change hardware. Because you're operating in a different physical CPU mode, you're not allowed to execute those instructions. So kernel mode is a generic name. Different architectures call it different things. On ARM and RISC, it's called supervisor mode. On RISC-V, it's called S mode, if you want to have it uh, shorter. On x86, it is called ring zero, because they used to say, they used to represent it as like a Venn diagram and have privilege rings where it gets smaller and bigger. Um, so that's where the name is from. And those naming conventions get really weird as things get more modern, which we'll see at the end of the course. But that actual barrier for CPU mode, that is a very strong barrier. And if any software is running in kernel mode, it is part of the kernel. It's kind of a dumb definition, but the kernel is just the part of your operating system that runs in kernel mode. So we'll see at the end, this makes a bit more sense when you figure out what's actually running in kernel mode can change between different full operating systems. So these instructions, again, it, you're only allowed to touch something like virtual memory if you are in kernel mode. That way, normal applications like your Hello World or anything you've written in C can't change virtual memory. Otherwise, if any old process could change virtual memory, then you could read any other process's memory by just kind of monkeying around with it. So you would have absolutely no security without this privilege level on your CPU. So this is kind of what it looks like graphically. On real modern CPUs, there's four, mo four different modes. So the first one is user mode, which is if you've written everything in C, you've run any application on your machine, it's all running in user mode. So this is applications, libraries, and that has the least privilege. It can access the fewest amount of instructions on your CPU. The next layer beyond that is the kernel that runs in supervisor mode or kernel mode, whatever you want to call it. And that will be able to do things like manage virtual memory and do some other things directly with the hardware. Now, there's some other modes that we won't get into in this course until the end where we'll get into the hypervisor a little bit. But the hypervisor, well, you need a different physical mode because your most traditional operating systems run in kernel mode. So if we want to have virtual machines and want to have an illusion of one physical machine being independent, there needs to be something with ultimate control of the hardware. So for virtual machines, if they're hardware supported, it will actually run in a CPU mode called the hypervisor. And the, this hypervisor mode will actually manage all of your virtual machines. So if you're using Windows and using Hyper-V, Windows is actually running as a hypervisor and then your virtual machine is running in kernel mode and it thinks it has access to the whole machine, but Windows is ultimately still in charge. And then at the very bottom, there's machine mode or M mode, and that just has unrestricted access to every single instruction. That's what you did in uh, 243, where there was no barriers. You could just execute any old instruction you wanted to. So that's like real low level embedded code where you're running one application. You don't need security or anything like that. So system calls aren't just requests to the operating system, but they are requests because they transition between user mode and kernel mode. That's the only way you can switch your application and request kernel mode, and then the kernel takes over and does whatever. So on Linux, there is only 453 different system calls or functions, if you want to think of them that way, and that is your entire interface to your kernel. So we've already seen some of these instructions like read and write, open and close, and at the bottom there's uh, exit group. But at the end of this course, the goal is you will understand what e each of these system calls do, how to use them, and how they're implemented without actually implementing them yourself. So that's kind of where this course is aimed. So 
The very nice thing about having system calls is you can trace them. There's this clear separation between user mode and kernel mode, and you can actually monitor any system calls that happen on your machine, at least on Linux. So on Linux, there is this strace program, so you can just stick it in front of whatever you're trying to run, and it will tell you all of the system calls that program makes. So let's go ahead and see what uh, our Hello World program does. So if we just stick an S trace in front of it, whoops, we can see the system calls it actually makes. It looks a bit weird here, and first off, this line <coughs> will explain it two lectures from now, uh, but we didn't make this. That's how your uh, program starts. But we start here with our write system call, and it looks a bit weird because we have our write, and then we have hello world, and then a new line, and then it, a bracket. So it looks like they're kind of fighting with each other, our hello world and strace. And this is where having two file descriptors for standard output and standard error is useful. So strace outputs things to standard error. So if we want to get rid of whatever strace is printing, we can do a shortcut like this, do you have to know the shortcut? No, well, it may be useful to you, probably. So two and then the arrow means redirect file descriptor two from this program to somewhere else. And a somewhere else could be on Linux. There's this dev null file that just kind of represents the void. Anything that goes there gets deleted immediately. And it's really, really fast at deleting things. So if we do that, we just see hello world because we're printing to file descriptor one and strace is using file descriptor two. So if we wanted to just see hello world, we could do that, which kind of defeats the purpose of running strace. But if I don't care about the output of my program, I could redirect file descriptor one instead and then I should just be able to see strace itself. So now it looks a bit cleaner so we can see what our program actually does. So our program write exit group, that's hello world. All right, so now that we have strace in our back pocket, we can see the nice thing about it is nothing can lie to you anymore. So you can tell what any application on your, at least Linux machine, is doing because you can monitor their system calls. So let's see what C does. So that's hello world in C. Anyone disagree with hello world in C? Looks pretty standard, right? Your guess is that it should probably do the same thing, a write and an exit, if everything has to go through uh, the kernel anyways. So if we want to see what it does, we'll strace it. Yep. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, so like this time? So hello world doesn't print for this one because I'm sending it to nowhere. So it's not getting printed anymore. So I'm just seeing only the output of strace here. Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and make sure our C works. So C works, looks the exact same, right? Prints hello world. Doesn't look very special. So let's get rid of that. So if C is like a real low level language that doesn't do much, it should look exactly the same. So let's run it and see what it does. It does a bit more, doesn't it? So can we argue what it does? Well, let's see. This means nothing to us. Nmap also means nothing to us. We'll learn it midway through the course. It's actually a way to request changing virtual memory in your process, but we don't really know what that's doing. There's this, no such file directory, so that didn't work, whatever that was. Then here, oh, it opens a cache. I don't know, caches are fast, so that's good, I guess. Cool, some more mmap things. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, it's written in C, what's this? Well, that's the standard C library. So the standard C library is just a file, so it has to open it. So it opened the standard C library, 
So that makes sense. We wrote our hello world in C, so it probably had to use the standard C library. So it got filed to Scripter 4, and then here it read, and we can see here that the standard C library is an ELF file. It doesn't say 7F because for some odd reason, this output is an octal. <laughs> so 177 in octal is 7F in hex. Aside from some weird utilities, you should never see octal and you should burn octal because it's kind of silly. But read some information from the standard C library, kind of makes sense. Did some more playing with memory. Did some more playing with memory. Git random, well, that's kind of cool. And then at the end, it did another BRK and then another BRK with the address it got from the first one. So that is actually the system call to request heap space. So this is what malloc is doing. So if you use malloc, it's actually using these system calls. Malloc is not a system call or anything. It's built on top of system calls that just manipulate the heap. And it works because malloc's the only thing that should manipulate the heap. So, cool. So, the nice thing about strace is, well, it works on anything. So, oops, Python 3. So, if I write hello world in Python, it does the same thing. If I want to figure out what the hell Python's actually doing, what should I do? strace it, right? Can't lie to me, can't hide anything. So, let's see, let's just see what Python does. Huh, Python seems to do a lot more than C. It's still going, still going. So Python does a lot. So we can kind of see what it's doing though. So Python, it did that right, it had to, because we saw it in our terminal, and it ended in exit group, but it did a lot of other stuff. But you can see some of it kind of makes sense. So it opened the script it had to execute, that makes sense, what, and it had to read from that file, so it read my print hello world. What didn't make sense is it had to read it twice. I don't know why it had to read it twice, but it read it twice for some reason. So maybe you can go back to the Python developers and fix that, say, hey, you don't need to read the file twice, you read it once, so you, you could fix some Python performance pro problems. Uh, I ran it before so we can see just how many system calls it makes, and it makes over 350. So I'm obligated to do this now. So JavaScript. I hate JavaScript, <laughs> and I will illustrate why it's bad. So if we want to figure out what JavaScript is doing, what should I run? S trace, let's see what JavaScript does. <laughs> that certainly seemed bigger. So let's see, there's exit group, so it had to end with that because it ended the process. Let's go up to see where our write system call was for hello world. Let me know when you see it. So there's a write, but it's write to file descriptor 13 8 bytes, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, what? I have no idea who wrote JavaScript, but yikes. We can scroll up. Again, we're looking for write hello world. Hey, there it is. So it eventually did it, but it did a lot of other stuff. We can see just how many system calls it made. Over a thousand for hello world. So if you want, to, you can judge, kind of judge a language by how many system calls it has to make or just the implementation of that. So at least judging off that, Python's at least three times better than JavaScript. Uh, yeah, there's your warning against JavaScript. It does a lot of stuff. Sorry? How many system calls did C have? Oh, so, how, so the question is how many system calls did C have? 
sorry. Do, do, do. Uh. Oh, we're all. C at 34. And some of it was just loading the standard C library and doing some other stuff. So suddenly, it's better than our, it's way worse than our two, but 34 is nothing compared to, you know, over 1,000. But for fun, you can do that on literally any program you run. So we could S trace, you could S trace whatever you want. You could S trace VS Code if you wanted to. It's going to output a lot of stuff, though. So here I just have, it was basically finding the standard C library there, loading it, and then setting up the heap and printing. So at the end of the day, it was our system calls. No matter what language, it had that write system call and that exit system call. So the kernel, like the Linux kernel, you can think of it as a long running process. And writing kernel code, which what you did in lab zero, or like over half of you have at least submitted the crowdmark thing, so you're, I guess, done with lab zero. So when you're doing that, the kernel is actually running at all times because if the kernel's not running, your computer's not running. <laughs> it's the thing that's managing everything. So the kernel is always running at all times. So writing kernel code is a lot more like writing library code. There's no main function or anything like that. It's already running. So the kernel lets you insert code into it and it will execute that as it's running. And that is called a module, which is what you wrote as part of lab zero. And in general, those modules are done like that because they execute on demand. So sometimes a module will be associated with a specific piece of hardware. So if you plug something into your computer, the kernel will know that, hey, that hardware corresponds to this module, which has the code to actually use it. So I'll load that module and do whatever it needs me to do and access the hardware. And that module will be running in kernel mode, so it can actually access that hardware and do things with it. So the kernel module you wrote, whenever you did that instmod command and inserted it into the kernel, your code was running in kernel mode. If you knew what to call, you could manipulate hardware directly if you really wanted to. In the, code you're write, yeah, in the code you're writing for lab zero, if you wanted to, you could go, you could end every single process, you could read any process of memory, you could do whatever you wanted to if you knew the Linux thing to actually, uh, to actually call to do whatever you wanted to do. So your code is actually running in kernel mode, it can access hardware, it's, da it's fairly dangerous. <laughs> and that's also why the machines here will not let you run a kernel module because if you could run a kernel module, then you could do whatever you want to on the system and it would have essentially no security because you could read any process's memory and now things suddenly aren't independent anymore. So that's why we're doing a virtual machine. So you can actually run code in kernel mode and do whatever you want. It's your machine and it won't break anything else because it's virtualized. So there's some different uh, kernel architectures which change how much software is actually running in kernel mode. Because kernel mode is, has direct access to the hardware, it's a big target for hackers because if you can get something that can escalate privileges and run in kernel mode, well, you've access to the entire system. It has no security anymore. So, one of the kernel architectures is called uh, monolithic, which basically just means, hey, we're kernel developers, we write perfect code all the time, so anything that can run in kernel mode, we will put in kernel mode. So this is the architecture of Linux. So that means your kernel is going to take care of virtual memory, it's gonna take care of process scheduling, like what process is running at, on your CPU at any given time, it's going to take care of interprocess communication. It's going to take care of file systems, device drivers, using your GPU, all of that stuff. So 
Some people are of the opinion that that is a horrible architecture because all your code is there. More code equals more opportunities to get exploited. So if I want to reduce my surface area of attack, I should use an architecture more like this. So there's another one called a microkernel. And the whole philosophy behind that is I will put only what's really needed running in kernel mode. Everything else I'll use in user mode and I'll just do system calls between them. So the minimum you have to do in the kernel is virtual memory management has to be done in the kernel. Otherwise, you could read each other processes or you could read memory from other processes. Kernel still has to maintain control over the CPUs and process what runs on the CPU at any given time and has to do some basic interprocess communication, at least transferring bytes between things. But you can move things up into user space. So your file systems, your device driver code could all be in user space or like advanced types of IPC that are just more than sending bytes between, like sending messages or something like that. And those are not the only two options. There's way different way, there's many different ways to draw those lines, each with different trade-offs. Uh, another trade-off why to use a monolithic kernel like this where everything is running in kernel space is doing system calls is actually slow. Transferring from user mode to kernel mode and actually physically switching the mode is way slower than just doing like a function call in C. So the more function calls you have to, or the more system calls you have to do, the slower it's gonna be. So if you only have to make one system call that does everything, that's gonna be a lot faster than if you have an architecture like this, where to do something simple, you might have to make, you know, dozens of system calls or maybe even hundreds. So one reason to do a monolithic is performance. But there's plenty of different lines you can draw that all have their different trade-offs, whoops. So hybrid kernels are kind of in between monolithic and microkernels. So like in Windows, sometimes emulation is in kernel mode. In Windows, it's in user mode. So they moved it out there. So it's not completely monolithic. They tried to move some stuff out like emulating DOS and all of that. Uh, on Mac OS, device drivers are actually run in user mode. They're not part of the kernel because the kernel is sacred to Apple and they also don't trust you. So that is another reason why Apple does that. And then there's another form of research where researchers try and get even smaller than a microkernel. So they've come up with terms like nano kernels and pico kernels. And the goal is to just push the boundary and move more stuff out of the kernel and into user mode. So there's no right answer for this. This is all engineering. Everything, every different architecture you come up with has different trade-offs and the main one being between monolithic and microkernels is just speed reducing the number of system calls because they are slow. So what do we have to take away from this lecture? Well, the kernel interfaces between different CPU mode boundaries, specifically user mode and kernel mode are the generic terms for them. So we need to know that the kernel is part of the operating system that interacts directly with the hardware to transfer to kernel mode and make requests for it to do things, you have to do system calls and every program has to use that interface no matter what. And because of that, we can S-trace. S-trace will become your friend uh, in this course and later on in your career. Again, nothing can hide from you with S-trace because it has to interact with the operating system or else it's not going to do anything useful. So S-trace is applicable no matter what language you use or what you run. We saw the file format and instructions to define hello world. Again, don't need to know the file format, don't need to know what the crazy bytes were, just know the system call ABI uses registers and C uses the stack is good enough for our purposes. And the difference between API and ABI, which we'll explore more next lecture. And like just using strace is like, probably one of the core things you should get out of this lecture. And all of those different kernel architecture that shifts how much code runs in kernel mode and how much runs in user mode. So that's it. Just remember, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together.